My name's Toby Raisin. I was doing all this training anyway. I was training by myself and I thought, why don't I just bring a camera along with me and um, just sort of record what I'm doing? It's just learning how you can use your strengths to like counterpart some of the weaknesses. I'd probably say the biggest obstacle was getting released from the Hereford Academy when I was at the age of like under 15. If you don't have a great game, there's, there's nothing you can do about it and there's no point worrying about it. There was nothing to have confidence in apart from my natural ability. There was no, there was no proper preparation before the game. I had a bit of like a nervous sweat on just because I, I hadn't prepared like I normally had. And that was definitely a bit of a kick up the ass. When I was 16, I set a five-year goal of signing a pro contract and I managed to do that in two years. You've got to work harder than everybody else. Work fast in the micro, but work slow in the macro. Hi guys and welcome back to the Footy Fans channel. This is episode 6 of the Footy Fans podcast and we're joined by a very special guest today, Toby Raisin. How are you doing, Toby? Yeah, really good, thank you. Really appreciate you getting me on, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it a lot. So, I've just got a few questions for you to ask about your football, how you're getting on and your aspirations for your career in the future. No problem so first, at all. to begin with, if you could just let the listeners know who you are, who you play for, your position, what level you play at and all that. Okay, so my name's Toby Raisin. Um, I'm a central defender. I'm currently 18 years old um, and I'm playing for Hereford FC in the National League North. I uh, signed my first professional contract in this summer of 2020. And yeah, I'll be playing for Hereford FC this year. I've been on loan for one loan spell um, for a month early in the season before the second lockdown kicked in. Um, but I'm back at Hereford FC now. So that's my current situation, yeah. Great. So... The first question, I guess, is what was your first football in memory as a child? Oh, first football in memory. Um, well, I've always been very into football and ever since I can remember as a young kid. But probably I'd say my first memory, I'd have to say when I first started playing for my Sunday league team at the age of under sixes. Um, yeah. I've lots of memories of playing with still some of my best friends now. So I'd have to say that they're probably my first memories. Oh, okay. Great. And what about your pathway into football? So from that under sixes to now, how is that? How is yeah. that progressed? Okay. You? So yeah, I started off playing for my local Sunday League team, uh, like I said, at the age of under six. A team called Lebury yeah. Swifts, um, which is literally my local club. And then at the age of I think under nines, um, I got scouted to go and play for the Cheltenham Town, who are a League Two team um, development yeah. centre. So it wasn't an academy; uh, it was literally just the first level, like a development centre. Yeah. And then I played there for two seasons, and then at the age of under 11s I moved to uh, Cardiff City um, Advanced Development Centre so that was um, through an actual open trial through uh, one of my friends who was already playing there I managed to get a trial there and I played there for two seasons Um, unfortunately that centre closed down and moved further away from my house which meant I couldn't play there anymore Um, and then I played back Sunday League for a year and then I actually played in a, a cup final for my school team and then I got scouted for the Hereford Academy. Um, that was probably, I'd say, at the age of about under 14s. Um, I played there for two seasons and then I actually got released at the age of under 15s. So I was at Hereford for two seasons. They released me and then I came back in through the um, academy at the age of under 18, joined the Hereford Academy back and that's how I've got into the first team this year. So it's been a bit mad, but... Um, yeah, and when I in the gap between when I got released and when I signed back for Hereford, I went and played uh, men's football in my local men's team, Lebury Town, for a year. So yeah, I did that at the age of sixteen. Ah, oh, so on and off with Hereford, but you're back yeah. there now. Have yeah, yeah, back there football. now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> right, perfect. Thank you for that. So the second question is, what or who inspired you to start documenting your football journey on YouTube? I've been watching a lot and it's interesting to know how you were inspired to start. Yeah, um, well, really, I started watching um, a load of different sort of YouTubers who were documenting their journey probably about, I'd probably say like three years ago now. People like, there's a guy called Become Elite, um, yeah. Matt Sheldon. I've, I watched a lot of his videos, a guy called Sheldon Tweedy as well. Um, yeah. And I just thought, like, I've always been into sort of like 
uh, cameras and all that sort of stuff and like sort of editing videos it's kind of been something that I've been quite interested in for a while and I just thought I started about two years ago and I just thought I was doing all this training anyway I was training by myself and I thought why don't I just bring a camera along with me and um, just sort of record what I'm doing so I just started about two years ago and it's just gone from there really yeah it's great it's helped a lot especially with my football it's been really useful so oh, I appreciate that's really good to hear yeah thank yeah, you it's great appreciate that um, obviously, you said you're a central defender. So, what players do you aim to base your game off while you're playing? Um, I, there's a load of different uh, types of de- like central defenders that I like to base my game off. There's people like, obviously, you got the obvious ones, which are like Virgil Van Dijk, who's obviously, yeah. in my opinion, is just different class. Like, he's, he's not, he doesn't really have a weakness. But no, um, the thing is, I would say is. I'm not the fastest central defender. I've got I'm very tall, I'm six foot four, um, decent in the air, but I'm not the fastest. And I like to sort of watch people like, for example, John Terry, who was very good in the air. It wasn't the it was quick, but he wasn't the fastest. And just sort of see like little details uh, of how he used his body well, used his like brain just to think one step ahead. And I think that's quite important. It's just learning how you can use your strengths to like counterpart some of the weaknesses that you might have so I think yeah John Terry's a really good one for me um, and yeah. I like watching him as well both right footed and left footed I think he's very underrated so yeah I like watching yeah, clips from him great defender yeah slept on definitely he was yeah, for sure, people yeah. don't see how great he really was his passing on both feet was a joke as well he could hit like diags on his left foot as well as his right if, if he, anybody goes back and watches some of his games he was ridiculous yeah he was I can't believe he, he doesn't get enough credit. He's a fantastic defender. No, yeah, for sure. Um, so, obviously, you've been in and out of development centres and Hereford and all this. So, who is the best player you've ever played with and against? Oh, um, who's the best player I've played with and against? Um, I'd say it, it would have to be um, pl- playing with, it would have to be for my current team with the first team at Hereford. Um, I would probably say one of the toughest people I've played against is a guy called, uh, well, I played with and against in training, but uh, a guy called Lennel John Lewis. He's a striker, he plays for Hereford and he, he's played for League One teams. Wow. He played for Shrewsbury, he's played for Newport, but he's our striker at the moment. And yeah, playing with him, is he's a very good player, as well as people in our team. A guy called Giles Coke used to play in the Championship. Um, for Sheffield Wednesday, very good. But um, I'd have to say playing against, in pre-season we played against uh, Newport County, a League 2 team, and their striker, a guy called Tristan Abrahams, was uh, a very good player. He was rapid and, um, yeah, he was he was, he was was really good. So I have to say he's probably one of the best players I've played against. Oh, and one other one's come to mind. Um, Josh Sheehan, he played for Newport as well. He's just made his... Uh, full Wales international debut uh, in the, this international break just gone so and play, he played the second half of that game as well so yeah they're probably the two best players I've played against so far right, I'll have a look at those later they sound yeah. great <laughs> you'll have to watch um, um, there's a video I uploaded a couple of weeks ago with my pre-season highlights you can see how fast that Tristan Abrams is compared to me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well I will I'll have a look at all of those and see how they play um, the next one, what is the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome in your footballing career? Um, obstacle, I'd probably say, to be honest, apart from a few injuries when I was first in the Hereford Academy, when I was a lot younger, I used because I'm quite tall, I used to get quite a few growing pains in my knees that caused me to miss quite a few games. But I wouldn't say I've been too bad with injuries. I've been quite lucky. I'd probably say the biggest obstacle was getting released from the... Hereford Academy when I was at the age of like under 15. Um, yeah. I'd say that's probably been my biggest setback, but it, to be honest, that's probably been the best thing that's happened to me because it really kicked me on. It really uh, motivated me and made me even more determined to get back there. I honestly think if I didn't get released, then I wouldn't be where I am now. So, yeah, that's probably my biggest obstacle, but also something that's helped kick me on at the same time. Yeah, so how did you deal with, obviously, regaining that motivation to spur you on to go and play for them again? Yeah, um, I'd probably say, uh, well, initially I was disappointed, um, very disappointed. I remember being really upset about it. 
Um, I wasn't like obviously it was my local club as well, and the fact I got released and they told me I wasn't good enough was obviously disappointing. But at the same time, it made me even more determined and to prove people wrong. I think that's something I get quite a lot. If people doubt me, then that gives me even more determination than if people give me praise. So um, yeah, I think it just made me want to improve it. And sometimes it's just about how you take things. You can take that one or two ways. You can think. They've told me I'm not good enough. Well, they must be right. I'm not good enough. Or you can go out, go train, train every day, improve and sort of get better and then show people what they were missing the first time around. So, yeah, I think that's how I dealt with it, really. Yeah, it's a game of opinions, isn't it? You can't let that sort of stuff. Yeah, get you definitely. Down. Keep and, going. Yeah, for sure. And that's that's football. And like, for example, now I could could have gone. I was on trial in pre-season with the first team and yes. if, if it was a different manager or a different team it might have been different but it's literally it's just football with a game of opinions like you said exactly right mate and I think you've just got to be determined and just keep pushing because there's always going to be one manager that puts faith in you and you just got to keep looking for it yeah right so on the opposite side a more positive question what do you feel is your biggest sporting achievement and why is it that I'd have to say um, signing my contract in the summer has probably been my biggest achievement so far because mm. uh, purely because um, obviously I'm only 18. Um, I haven't had the chance to play too much first team football yet uh, and win any trophies or promotions or anything like that. So I'd have to say getting my first contract has probably been my biggest achievement because that's the sort of first step on the ladder really. But the, the most important thing that I can't do is um, get complacent on that now and it's even though it's probably my biggest achievement to date it's important that I don't think about that too much and I keep working hard otherwise it'll be the last achievement I get so yeah that, that's important as well I think yeah I agree so I've just I wrote this question down yesterday but I've just seen you uploaded a video about it but just generally <laughs> what is a typical day for you as a professional footballer um, so I train on a Monday morning and a Thursday morning, um, which is with the team, um, which is two hour sessions and then a one hour session in the gym. And then normally there's games on a Tuesday night and Saturday night. So uh, Saturday day, sorry. Um, so then obviously the only three days I have off are Wednesdays, Fridays and Sundays. So on a Wednesday normally, depending on whether I've played a game or not on the Tuesday. If I played a game on the Tuesday, then it'll be more of a, a recovery day. I'll go for a light jog, maybe get on the ball, a light little 30-minute session, but nothing heavy whatsoever. Um, a Friday is obviously the day before a game, which is normally, for me, like a 30-minute session on the ball, just really light, just getting my legs moving, that sort of thing, making sure I'm stretching loads and eating the right foods, getting ready for the next day, uh, for the next game. And then on a Sunday would be the same as the Wednesday was like a recovery day but on the Tuesday and um, on the Monday and Thursday sorry when I've got team training um, they're the sort of heavy days really when you're with the team a solid two-hour session um, and then gym afterwards but to be honest it all depends on whether you're playing games or not so for me at the moment I haven't been in the squad for the last two games so I think it's important for me to do extras and get that extra work in so then when I get selected, I'm making sure I'm still match fit. So, yeah, it, it kind of varies, but that's the basis of like the basic um, week in my life, really. Yeah, so it's pretty hectic. You should be working very hard to get yeah. into that team. But, yeah, it's, that's what it's all about, I think, just working hard and trying to improve. Yeah, that's all you can do in life, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, obviously, you've had a lot of important games this summer. Obviously, your trials to get into the first team. How do you deal with pressure and nerves before a game? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so pre-season um, was was tough. We've played quite a few decent oppositions. Uh, so we played against Newport, like I said earlier. We played against TNS, who are a Welsh team who won the... The, they're called the New Saints who won the Welsh Premier League like nine out of the last ten seasons so it's quite a few big games but I think for me the most important thing I've lived by over the last two years when it comes to games is just having confidence in my preparation I think if you've prepared like the best you can if you've done everything in the week, months, year leading up to that game then 
if you don't have a great game, there's, there's nothing you can do about it and there's no point worrying about it. Like, So when I'm going into a game, I know I've done everything I can so I can just enjoy it, have confidence in what I've prepared like to get into that game and then just play my natural game and just express myself. So I think that's the way I think about it. I used to get nervous before games, um, probably about over two years ago now. Um, but for me, because I wasn't training enough, if, like at that time, that's probably why I got nervous. There was nothing to have confidence in apart from my natural ability. There was no, there was no proper preparation. But now, the way I see it, as long as you've done prepared right, then you've got nothing to worry about. Yeah, I mean, if you pre- preparation is the main thing, isn't it? It's just being ready, and there's yeah. nothing more you can do after that. I understand what you mean. You get nervous, and I always did as well. But similar to you, I just think. I know what I'm capable of and I know I can play well so I just relax and play your own game. Yeah, it's definitely it. and the thing is I don't think you can relax if I've got peace of mind and I can relax and play if I know I've done everything right if that makes sense. However, yeah. before I don't think I could do that because obviously I hadn't prepared properly and I wasn't there was, there was nothing to relax on but yeah, now I feel more more chilled out, more more freedom to express myself because of the preparation so yeah I think that's the important thing for me yeah 100% like before a game if you you know if you haven't done enough and that's yeah. mainly where it stems 100%, from isn't it? 100% 100% yeah getting ready for a game and just you know you haven't put in the work that week so you can't expect to yeah. be it's even, completely chilled out it's even the little things for me I remember like I'll be totally transparent after my signing got announced of my contract and it got announced on all the Hereford official Twitter and all that sort of stuff, everybody would send yeah. me congratulation messages and all that. That was on, on the Friday and I had a game the next day. And uh, on the Saturday, it was it was the pre-season game against Surrey Hall Moors away from home. And like I said earlier, normally on a Friday, day before a game, I'll go out and do a, like literally just a 30-minute session on the ball just to get my touch, just get a feel for the ball. And on that Friday, I was so busy, like talking to people on the phone, all that sort of stuff, that I didn't get in my 30 minute session. And I remember going into that away game, um, Surrey Hill Moors in pre-season and just feeling like before the game, I had a bit of like a nervous sweat on just because I hadn't prepared like I normally had. And it's it's mad really, but that's how my brain works. So and that was definitely a bit of a kick up the ass, even though I hadn't done, I'd done everything else right like I'd ate right on the Friday I went to bed early I'd done all my stretching and the fact that I hadn't just done my 30 minute session just made me feel uncomfortable before that game and I had a de- to be honest I was a bit lucky I had a decent game we kept a clean sheet and won 1-0 but <laughs> before the game yeah. before the game I did not feel as confident as I normally did so I think that just sums it up for me really yeah it's the guilt isn't it you feel like mm, yeah 100% you need to be performing at your best every day yeah yeah definitely yeah, so the next one is, obviously, you said during your week, it's busy, two games a week, lots of training. How do you recover after a match or a tough training session? Yeah, good question. Um, so, for me, it's very important to get... Food is probably the most important thing, I think. Um, so, after a training session, I'll take food with me in the car to train in, uh, and then i eat that as soon as I get in the car after training. So... And I'll also have a, a protein shake after training as well. So I'll literally just have a bit of protein powder and water after training. And that helps my muscles recover. And then I also have either a pasta meal or maybe a couple of sandwiches with like tuna, sweet corn and that sort of thing. So just making sure I get my carbs and proteins on board so my muscles can recover straight away. And then I think also making sure I do my stretching in the evening as well. Just loosen up a little bit. That's probably the most important thing. Probably food... I'd say food um, and also sleep as well. Sleep is yeah. Sleep and food are probably the two most important ones. And then stretching's a bonus. The day after a game, if you go for a light jog, little recovery session, those are probably added bonuses. But the most important things to get right is the nutrition and the sleep as well. Yeah. Do you ice bath? Yeah. Uh, um, showers, anything like that? Yeah. I, I, if I'm training at home then I'll have like an ice bath or something but by the time I've come so I have to travel an hour and a half to train and so uh, if if I 
um, train and I don't have like a cold shower or hot shower or whatever at training, then I, I won't ice bath when I get home just because it's so long after. But if I need to do that after a game, I would definitely do that after a game as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So you were saying about the nutrition part. Do you follow any specific diet? Or just, um, just I don't follow a specific diet, no, but I, I do usually eat the similar sort of foods. Um, in terms of um, on a game day, it, it's pretty much identical every single game day, just because I like that um, sort of, I like the, I don't know what how to describe it, I just like having the same thing, like the routine. I like yeah. having the same thing, just so my body used my body's used to it. But in terms of specific diet throughout the week, um, no, I wouldn't say it's identical, but it's similar sort of foods like pasta, chicken, rice, um, potatoes. Just or the, I, I kind of eat just a basic diet, pretty a nice, good, balanced diet, and I think that's the most important thing. As long as you're getting a bit of a variety of everything, veg, carbs, protein, then that's the most important thing. Yeah, how often would you say you have cheat meals? Obviously, because you got to reward yourself for all the hard work, or do you? Yeah, not? Um, I, I I do um, sometimes, but I'm actually pretty strict with my diet, and I don't uh, drink alcohol. I don't drink fizzy drinks or anything like that. I only drink water. Um, uh, for me, I'm, I do. Uh, don't get me wrong. Every now and then, I have a cheat uh, meal. I probably have a cheat meal. I don't, I don't really count it or anything like that, but maybe, I don't know, once, I might have one once a week, but problem some weeks I might not have one, but um, yeah, in terms of f uh, water and stuff, that's all I have, um, but I don't really have the urge to, um, sorry, I don't have an urge to have a cheap meal or anything, um, to be honest, it's generally because I, I don't know. I don't know to be fair. I'm kind of programmed, so I just l like eating the same things anyway, and I like yeah. eating healthy food. So I don't generally feel the need to have a cheat meal. It's not because I don't want to. Or I think there's something wrong with it. I, I I think it's totally fine to have a one cheat meal a week or something like that to reward yourself. There's yeah. no problem with that whatsoever. But sometimes I just don't really even think about it. <laughs> no. Do you use any supplements to assist your diet? Um, I, I have protein powder um, to have after yeah. training and stuff, but I only have that after training. I don't, um, or on a day where I'm going to be training before training or something like that. Um, but apart from that, um, no, I don't take any supplements. I have um, used creatine in the past or started to use that, which is like a um, something to use after a workout um, to help get your energy levels up and stuff like that, but um, no, I haven't. I don't use that anymore. So the only thing I use is protein powder. Okay, I see. Um, obviously, on recovery days, you don't. You're not as active as you would be in a busy training day and stuff like that. So do you read any books to on self improvement, training that sort of stuff? Yeah, uh, I actually really like reading. To be fair, there's a book that I've read quite a few times, and I've it's like it's, i've read it literally like three or four times i think it's that good it's a book called um relentless by tim grover and um i don't know if you've heard of it before but if anybody listening or yourself if you want to read a book to help motivate you then honestly it's ridiculous after you've read that you feel like you can go run a marathon i'm not even joking so <laughs> um yeah that's a really good book that i like reading and um that's probably the main thing like I do outside of um, sort of playing football and uh, I obviously I do my on recovery days they're the days where I do most of my video editing as well because um, I edit all my yeah. YouTube videos myself so that's what I normally do on um, my recovery days so yeah but the reading is definitely a hobby of mine yeah yeah I read a few as well I've got the champion's mind and I'm not actually sure what it's called uh, let me have a look Soccer tough. There's, I've got two of those, and they are really helpful for motivation and stuff like that. What? Who's the champions mind one written by? Uh, James Aframov. No, I might have to have a look. I'm looking for a new book at the moment. To be fair, I just finished. Um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. Outliers. It's like a book about the ten thousand hours rule. And um. Ah uh, yeah. But um, I need a new book, so I'll, I'll check that out. Yeah, and soccer tough. I'm not sure who it's by, but I just bookmark so many pages it's so useful to oh, help really? with yeah like uh like it's just so good for the 
mental side, so stuff you're not comfortable with in games. Like I had a really big fear of penalties. Like I missed one like five years ago, and I've never taken one since. Oh really? And I, yeah, and I read that book, and it was just like if you, it gave you all the advice on how to deal with stuff like that. And just about a month ago, I played my first game. Uh, obviously after COVID. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I won a pen, and I was so so scared, but using that book it just really in my head I just wasn't worried and I took it and I scored and it was quite oh, a big awesome. barrier for me to get over and yeah yeah that's really that really, good. really helped yeah well done that's yeah that's massive that's I think that's really good yeah fair play yeah yeah thank you um so the next one you've said we've seen that you're able to play in midfield and even right back on the odd occasion despite being a centre back normally how much of an how much of an advantage do you think that gives you on the pitch having that versatility yeah so um the centre mid roles i used to play centre mid in my youth team so um and for my local saturday team when i was 16 for the men's team um i've kind of played there all throughout my youth really so i guess i've taken a lot of that technical ability from midfield and transferred that back into centre back um, and that mm-hmm. helps me a lot um, and then right back, I played um, one game in pre-season there against um, TNS, the New Saints. And I do mm. think that um, if you've got a bit of versatility, then I think that's important because, well, if, if a manager needs you to do a job there, then you can get on the field of play and actually start in the eleven. But for me now, I don't think um, playing in midfield would be such a viable option. I'm definitely a lot more suited to play in centre-back. So... Um, but if I needed to do a job there, I, I would. And but I think definitely, like you said, you can apply different things from each position into um, whatever role that you're more comfortable in. Yeah. And do you think, obviously, being at centre back, but knowing what a midfielder would be thinking, do you think that helps? What what you can help them do, despite not being in their shoes? Do you think that helps in yeah. terms of doing stuff for them? Yeah, de- definitely. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I, I haven't actually thought of it that way before, but um, yeah, I think for sure, because I guess if you know that if you didn't want to receive the ball in there as a midfielder, then as a centre-back, you're not going to be trying to give them the ball in there. So yeah, definitely, I think if if you can know what they're thinking, then that gives you an advantage as well. So for sure, that's a really good point, yeah. Yeah, it's a great asset to have in your game to be able to play in multiple positions like that, even if it's not as comfortable as you'd like it to be. It's definitely helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, so your next one is, what are your short-term and long-term goals football-wise, as many as you've got? Yeah, OK. Um, so I, my short-term goals for this season, um, this is my first season being with the first team in um, the professional environment. So last year I made the bench on one occasion when I was with the under-18s for the first team. So I got on the bench, named on the on the substitutes for the first team. But for this season, as my, as it's my first year, um, I set myself the goal of starting one game, uh, one competitive game um, for the first team. So whether that's a cup game or uh, a league game, I, I want to start one game, and that's that's my aim because it's definitely a, diff- a difficult team to break into. We've got a lot of very good players. Um, yeah. And as it's my first year and I'm still young, I'm only 18, I think that's the most realistic goal for me at the moment. And yeah. um, I set my five-year goal. So I think I set these goals about a month ago, by the way, just for a bit of context, um, just after I signed my contract. And then my five-year goal, so I'll be 23 at the time, my five-year goal is to be um, playing in um, for a League 2 team or an equivalent um, level team. Uh, abroad and another goal on that one is to have played 50 professional games by the time I'm 23 so they're my they're my goals for the next five years so it's they're not easy goals whatsoever but um, I set them my goal two years ago so when I was 16 I set a five-year goal of signing a pro contract and I managed to do that in two years so I thought why why not Um, you might as well aim, aim high and then if you if you if you, if you just miss any you won't you won't go far wrong so yeah they're my goals for the next five years really yeah what countries would you look to 
progress into or anywhere really? Um, I think it would depend where you have contacts. That's the most important thing, really. If if I knew somebody who had contacts in a different country, that would be the main reason for going abroad. But I wouldn't um, I wouldn't go abroad just uh, randomly. If if you know, if I had connections there, I would try and play abroad. But obviously. It's difficult to play abroad due to the language barriers yeah. and visa issues and all that sort of stuff. So I, I'd try and stay in the UK if possible because I think that's the best and most viable option. But if I had a connection abroad through a teammate or a coach or something like that, then that would definitely be something that I'd look into and I'd be more than willing to play abroad as well. Yeah, and back to your short-term goal of breaking into the first team. How tough is the competition between you and the other centre-backs in that team? Yeah, so um, it, we've got some very good defenders. Uh, we did actually have three centre-backs ahead of me earlier in the season, but one of them's actually left. So technically I am third-choice defender at the moment, but the two ahead of me are very good defenders. Um, so the one's played... A lot of games in League Two. He's, he's 29 and he's probably in his prime at the moment. So he's a, he's a great defender and he's somebody who's helped teach me a lot in pre-season as well, give me a lot of advice. And the other one um, is, is 23 and he's played a lot of games in the National North, which is the league that Hereford played in. Um, but yeah, they're both really good defenders. And to, like the thing is, you want them to do the best they can because you want the team to do the best and yeah. you've always got to be supportive but there's always going to be things like suspensions and somebody might get a niggle one game and they might miss one game due to injury and you might get an opportunity to play so yeah it just it's, it's all about being patient working hard in training proving that you're ready to go and then when there's an opportunity taking it so yeah it's, it's going to be difficult but I think as long as you keep training hard and showing what you can do then that's there's not much more you can do really yeah, it's a very selfless way of look, looking at it. I mean, lots of players would be disappointed by the fact that you've got such good players in your position, but it's good to see that you're sort of inspired by them and yeah, take I, note of what they do. I think that's important. If 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 you think about it as though um, they're blocking your path, then I, I don't think that's going to get you anywhere. I think no. it's more important to see what you can you can learn off them take things out of their game put them in yours if you take a bit from everybody's game and put them into your game and then make your game more more well-rounded and it will just help you improve in the long run and i think that's the most important thing if you can get little bits of advice you just got to be a sponge really take as much information as you can yeah um and it'll help you in the long run yeah definitely yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he's. I'm sure the players you're playing with, they only want for the best for you as well, and I'm sure they're just trying to help you out just as much as you're supporting them. So. Yeah, exactly, definitely. What are the three most important pieces of advice you have for young players aspiring to become a professional footballer like yourself? Three best pieces of advice. I'd say the first piece of advice. Um, You've got to work harder than everybody else. Um, realistically, everybody in your team is going to want to play at the highest level they can and they're going to want to also be professional footballers. And I think the most important thing is you've got to be the hardest working and you've got to be putting in the most extra work. Um, so otherwise, they're going to improve more than you. Uh, I'd say that that's my first point. I'd say my second point is don't get caught up in worrying about how some players are better than you now. And for, I'd say, it, it, backing up that point, what I mean by that is, for me, at the age of 14, when I was playing for the Hereford Academy, I was by no means the best player in that team. Uh, obviously, I got released at the end of the season, but a lot of those players were uh, way ahead of me at that time. Um, but I think it's all about if you keep putting in work consistently over the years, then you can definitely improve and become one of the best players in that team. So I'd say for the second point, I'd say work work fast in the micro. Um, this is a quote from Gary V. actually. It's I don't know if you've heard of Gary V, but he's like a motivational yeah. speaker. And he says, um, work fast in the micro, but work slow in the macro, which means... If you're working hard every single day in the micro, working quickly, trying to improve as fast as you can, but work slow in the macro, so be patient and eventually it'll pay off in the long run. So I think that's my second point. And I'd say for my third point, 
Um, third point, I'd say. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> um, I'd say also, as you're looking to progress forward, I'd say working off the pitch in terms of networking and contacting teams and coaches is just as important as what you're doing on the pitch. Yeah. Um, not so much when you're a lot younger, but I'd say as you start to get older, um, trying to get into new teams and into men's teams, it's very important that you build up a network of people that you know within football because that's honestly sometimes more important than how good you are on the pitch. If you if you have good contacts, if you know coaches, if you get on well with coaches um, that are working at a high level, I think that's just as important. So I'd say as soon as you're ready and looking to get even into academies, not even men's teams, even if you're looking to get into an academy, I'd say contacting people and just doing as much as you can off the field as well to help your game is really important. So, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say I'd say that's probably my third bit of advice. Yeah, I think uh, Chupu Moteng for Bayern is probably the best example of that. He's not the best player in the world, but he's got a good network around him to get him to play for world-class teams wow, like PSG, yeah, Bayern. Definitely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's a great example. Yeah, he's obviously a very good player. Otherwise, I don't think he would would sign they would sign him but like you said yeah he must be doing something right off the pitch <laughs> yeah good network around him must be a humble person to you know from stoke to yeah, yeah. psg Definitely. got to it's pretty crazy uh upright so he's done well yeah definitely. Fair. right well that is all the questions i've got thank you very much for coming on and talking to me no problem thanks for having me so we really appreciate you coming on as our first guest um if you did like the podcast please like and subscribe make sure make sure to subscribe to toby as well Do, what 2000 subscribers at the moment yeah just just at 2200 yeah yeah so go subscribe um and we will see you in the next podcast thanks again toby no problem <laughs>